So I'm going to read their introduction because I want to make sure I don't miss anything important. Um, so, Inelia Hernandez Guzman is Mixteco, an indigenous group in Oaxaca, Mexico. She is a first generation college student at Highline College, pursuing a degree in cybersecurity and forensics. She speaks three languages Spanish, English, and, and Mixteco. She immigrated to the U.S. with her parents and her siblings in 2014. She just returned from an incredible internship at the University of Texas in Austin, where she used data science to study the impact on water sources for indigenous people. Uh, she is very involved in mentorship here on campus and is excited for her future. Her main goal is to earn her master's degree uh, or PhD in computer science. Uh, Taisha Kukui Akana is native Hawaiian, Chinese, Korean, Filipino, and Spanish from Hawaii. She is in her last quarter at Highline College and will be graduating with honors. During her time at Highline, she has been a leader in the Anapizi program as a student ambassador. She also tutors and mentors students in the Highline School District. She came to Highline from Hawaii to play for the Highline College women's volleyball team. And she is proud to be a native indigenous POC. You also can see her on the A-line buses. <laughs> Um, Rosa Garcia Rodriguez is an undocumented, an unapologetic mother of two, community member, and scholar. Um, she was born in Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City, current day Mexico City, um, and was raised on occupied Jawamish, Makoshu, and Puyallup land. Her maternal grandfather was from the Tenek tribe of the Huasca region in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. She is actively seeking to honor and reconnect with her indigenous roots. She graduated from Highline College last spring with her Associates of Arts with an emphasis in diversity and globalism. She hopes to pursue her bachelor's degree in youth development at Highline by the fall of 2020. She hopes to broaden the conversations about the displacement of indigenous people of Latin America, settler colonialism, anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness, and heal the intergenerational traumas caused by colonialism in honor of her ancestors, uh, Donatine, her children, and the strong women in her life, uh, and the future seven generations that she does this work for. Uh, Leslie Jimenez is an indigenous scholar, spoken word artist, and cultural steward. Her works focus on issues pertaining to indigenous resilience, survival, ways of knowing, knowledge systems, indigenous women's strength, colonialism, cultural genocide, and decolonization. Uh, she was raised on occupied Tumunga and Chumash territory, now known as Southern California. She creates to honor the memories of her mother, Maria Cruz, her grandmother, Eloisa, and her great-grandmother, Isidora, matriarchs of the Otomi people uh, of Mexico. Uh, Ismael Chutepan so, uh, Lopez uh, uh, is our panel at the end. <laughs> Ismael's grandparents began coming to the Northwest uh, in the 1950s from Texas. They settled in, 19, in the 1980s in Mount Vernon, uh, where he spent most of uh, his childhood. His family were farm workers um, and are now passed due to health issues. Uh, he has dedicated his life to working uh, to address systemic racism, equity, environmental justice, and cultural survival of previously colonized communities of color. He worked on the Farm Workers Solidarity Committee for 10 years and is currently um, uh, and, and was involved in the statewide mobilization for the May 1st general strike. From 2006-2011, uh, he created an after-school empowerment program for Chicanx students who were deemed at risk based on indigenous culture, community engagement, and intergenerational healing. He has been involved in fighting or for organizing and organizing for undocumented displaced workers and families. He is dedicated to teaching about indigenous Mexican culture as a means to address issues that we are facing today. He believes that until we heal from the original trauma of colonization, we cannot begin to deal with the issues we are facing. Uh, it is important to understand that the greatness of indigenous resiliency, creativity, and genius in order to find these qualities within ourselves. Um, he quotes Malcolm X, who said that only a fool would allow for their enemies to teach their children. He believes that our lack of empowering history was designed by the system of white supremacy as an institutional byproduct of the school system built to keep us powerless. He is currently working with the State Board Health to create an office of equity in the state of Washington, as well as working to support the Environmental Justice Task Force. 
He holds space every Monday um, at El Centro de la Raza for Aztec dancing and philosophy, as well as leads workshops in local middle schools and high schools. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, I would like to get and introduce myself. So my name is Elena Cervantes, and I work over at Outreach Services, and I'll be facilitating the panel today. I uh, just wanted to give you all some guidelines, like you don't have to answer every single one question, but don't not answer any questions. Um, so one or two. Um, and then we just got feedback that question number two is a little dense. So we're going to leave that question till the end. Um, so we we'll have time. But yeah, there is one microphone. So if you want to pass it back and forth. And then just also, like, this is just to highlight the stories of the different indigenous communities outside of Turtle Island, which is now known as North America. Um, and anyone can start. Just grab the mic. Uh, so the first question, what does indigeneity mean to you? <laughs> Sorry, I have a heart <laughs> stroke. Um, so for me, it means, uh, I would say power, it means unique. Uh, I can express myself as indigenous by speaking my other language, my first language, which is Mixteco. Um, so I can try um, a legend uh, in my own uh, language. And it feels very powerful, and it feels uh, yeah. Uh, to me, indigeneity means uh, being a walking survivor of more than 500 years of ongoing colonialism and genocide. Um, and being an apologetic about the uh, historical and living DNA and the truth that lives within each one of our bodies, despite the ongoing displacement that's happening. Um, it also means uh, coming back now to reclaim, rehonor, resist, and uh, embrace more than 500 of our ancestors before us but also working to sustain and bring longevity and uh, um. people are going to be here still in the present and in the future. So thinking about more ahead of us. So indigeneity means that in indigeneity, it means living past these geopolitical borders that were man-made by the colonizers to separate us and to segregate us. So for us as indigenous people, there is no borders. Um, that's what indigeneity means. It means to remember who we are, where we come from, and where we will continue to be. Um, to me, uh, indigeneity, <clears throat> um, I'll speak it in terms of language. Um, so I'm Hawaiian and a word we use is Kanaka Maoli, and in New Zealand, also known as Aotearoa, they say Tangata Maori. So the main focus here is Maoli and Maori, which means like the true people, or the, in other words, like the native people. And another term is like, uh, for Tahiti is like, and New Zealand is Tangata Fenua, which means like people of the land. So how I see indigenous uh, indigeneity is like being people of the land and being carrying the responsibility of being the protectors of the land as a um, as like um, my peers have said is where for me indigenous means like when my home is. My home and my people are threatened. I'm the front of the line um, because we know the more that's being taken, which is which has been taken, um, in the future, what will be left, especially for our children. Like growing up, we already lost a lot of things, being displaced. But just imagine, like. If this is a reality for a lot of indigenous people as well, 
just being able to hear or read about places, but never being able to experience it, it's really heartbreaking. Um, to me, indige indigeneity means um, relearning uh, my, tr my traditions, learning the language, uh, also going back to and giving back to the land. Um, I feel like I was displaced twice. Uh, so my mom uh, is Huasteca, so she was displaced. And then uh, as a form of protecting me, uh, she didn't teach me or my sisters any of her traditions. And then being brought over here to the US, I feel like it was another form of displacement. and. Uh, a way of like they my peers have mentioned uh, gen uh, cultural genocide. So now uh, I want to be able to teach my children the, uh, these traditions in a way that's appropriate, and I'm not appropriated from other indigenous cultures. Uh, so also being very aware of that, um, and then acknowledging that I'm a guest on like indigenous land. Th this is not my land. Uh, my people's land is and what is now Mexico and uh, so being also very aware of that, that I'm a guest on Duwamish land. Okay, the next question. So we keep hearing this word blessing, um, decolonizing, almost like the word diversity has been co-opted without the intention of actually taking action. Uh, so in your own words, what does decolonizing mean to you, especially when we speak about it in the context of indigeneity without borders? Um, so for me, decolonizing has become a, some people have come to term it as a buzzword. It means not just uh, decolonizing in the aspect, most people think of uh, taking back all the, the land that was stolen but it means decolonizing holistically. So it decolonizes in all seven directions, which means like mental, emotional, physical, environmental, um, in your consciousness, in all seven directions. And it means doing that work to then restitch yourself back to together from what's been torn. And dismantling and questioning how you've been conditioned to think and be and live and your way of knowing. It means that, and then also it's going past a land acknowledgement. It's going to take action to not just acknowledge the land, but also do your work. And for instance, I'm a visitor on Duwamish land on Coast Salish territory. So as an indigenous person myself, I'm a visitor and I have to acknowledge that, but also give back to the community whose land you're currently occupying and acknowledge your own privilege that you are reaping benefits from the land because your presence there is a displacement to those people. So learn their history, learn their ways, honor them, ask them, and, and ask them how, how you can be a, a cultural steward, but also honor them as a visitor. So it means decolonizing not just yourself, but it means decolonizing all of the spaces that have been um, captured by disease of colonialism. And because if you don't start healing this now, it's gonna start, you're gonna feel the effects seven generations from now. You're gonna pass that on to our future generations. So it means decolonizing even within this ivory tower, uh, the curriculum, the policies, the classrooms, and our own self. And acknowledging if you're not indigenous, acknowledging that you're a visitor to Turtle Island and hold yourself accountable. Your ancestors might have done what they did, but how are you going to change that and think about future generations? Um, uh, speaking with the permission of, uh, of the ancestors and uh, the ancestors of these lands, um, my elders, I, I just, uh, I guess, uh, I see it a little differently um, as far as decolonizing and indigeneity. I think um, 
I think when we think about uh, decolonizing, it's become something that is like very popular and very um, decolonize this, decolonize that. It's something that's really like a term that's being, I think, in my humble opinion, overused. And I think we have to understand um, uh, the colonization begins in in the mind, in the in the in the spirit, in the body of the person, and and the process to decolonize begins there, begins with with our mind, our heart, with our um, our, our spirit, with our everyday walk of life, and so I think as a uh, as a indigenous person, like for me, before I try to decolonize anything, I need to work on myself because I still find myself uh, thinking in. In, in with my colonized mind, I still find myself um, questioning things that I know in in my heart are true, right? Part of a, a, our tradition, the uh, Mexicayot, we understand that the, the uh, tonali or what could be is is the is the tonali is 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 the sun rays that exist within us, and and it resides. Uh, in in our um, in our stomach, it resides in our uh, what they call the solar plex, right? And so they say that with that, when we feel something, when we sense something, this is where this is our spirit tell, talking to us. And so I have trouble, you know, communicating with with my spirit, with myself, with understanding and understanding what I need to do as a person and how I need to communicate and and. Uh, and tread softly on land that is not that, that is not mine, right? The and you know the land um, doesn't belong to us. We belong to the land, um, but there were people who belonged here first, and so to tread 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 gently on the land that we we walk, recognize that beneath each footsteps are the uh, blood, sweat, tears, and bones of the ancestors, and the. Um, and just to be conscious of that and raise our consciousness because sometimes when we speak about indigeneity or about decolonizing, we think, oh, we just think, um, we think of the Hollywood Western Native American, right? We don't think about the African indigenous person. We don't think about the Islanders. We don't think about Mexico. We don't think about all these other places that have indigenous people. But everywhere we go around the world, you're going to find a fire. You're going to find a dance. You're going to find songs and stories of those people. And so to me, that is what, that, that's what decolonizing is, is learning those dances, learning those songs, listening to those stories, being close to the fire, learning those ways, and, and unlearning some of these things that we've been taught. Right? Unlearning these things because um, when we think about today is Indigenous Peoples Day, we, okay, it's Indigenous Peoples Day, but it's still based on a date that's based on a colonial history, right? So when do we celebrate a day based on our own history, based on our own people? Many of us bring traditions and, and celebrations from other parts of the world or where, where we're Indigenous from, and, um, and I think we should celebrate those things as well. Um, so I'll just say about that much. Okay, so uh, yeah, so you make a right point. Uh, I would say that it's true. Uh, I, when i at home, I have to like teach to my uh, nephew and niece to uh, speak Mixteco, but I also need to teach them how to speak Spanish and uh, English. So they have to grow with this uh, knowledge because we are knowing the land that we, this is not our own land, it's all of us lands. And so we need to, uh, to learn every, every place where we go, we need to learn these things, the culture, language, and uh, the way we're uh, acting. So we need to respect each other. Uh, so I grew up with a family where uh, we have to respect each other, like for elders to youngers, 
so we we'll still uh, try to to do this every day. Um, <clears throat> to me, decolonizing means to um, break down like the barriers that we were taught, or like challenging uh, the perceived reality that most people think in the constructs of like colonialism. So one thing for me is like teaching the youth to like love themselves, love themselves for like how they look, for you know their curly hair, the color of their skin, um, the fact that they might have accents, because um, the we're taught through colonialism and like Eurocentric values that <clears throat> something what we are is not valuable or desirable. So like to first like teach yourself and to teach the youth because they are gonna carry on your message, but to teach them to love each other and like heal themselves as um, was said earlier. I think that's really what decolonizing is because um, colonialism has hurt a lot. So the first step would be just to heal and just break down the barriers like, oh, I can't do this because of this. I shouldn't do this because I look like this or I sound like this. You Once you start loving yourself and breaking the barriers, you'll see like, okay, we might look different, but you're my brother, you're my sister. Like we're connected even though um, they might label us as different because of these borders. Well, in reality, not, in our reality, but like in other, in the indigenous reality, those borders are non-existent. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question, question number four. It is not uncommon knowledge that the islanders across Oceania and the Pacific have been in constant communication with each other, especially when you see shared words, navigational system, and canoe design. However, people may not know that Pacific Islanders and the indigenous people of North America have also been in community way before Christopher Columbus, as we've seen through chicken bones and indigenous plants in their respective place. What does this connection and shared knowledge mean to you? I think that this touches on the aspect of a shared connection. Um, whereas indigenous people were all more than, there's more than 585, 590 something re federally recognized tribes. There's non-recognized tribes by the government that they have imposed that system. So we as indigenous people have known that we're indigenous and we've communicated across, even through canoe, um, through travel, and you can see these through the stories. If you go up to like the Southwest, some of their uh, stories are the same or similar to those down in Mexico. If you look at Alaska Native or like First Nations, uh, Canadian Native uh, stories, they're very similar even in the art within uh, Coast Salish territories and food. So. Even to this day, we do cultural sharing as a cultural exchange. Not cultural appropriation, but cultural exchange. And something that you notice is when you go back, and when I say go home, you go home to the knowledge systems that were um, hibernating. They weren't exactly extinguished. But these memories are genetic memories that come back. And sometimes someone from a different nation may teach you Hey, did you know that your, your ancestors, they, were, they grew corn, and this is how you grow corn. And they themselves are not from, from Mexico, or they're not uh, from the Southwest. They're from a different tribe, but they share this knowledge with you because someone shared that with you. Something that's similar to across uh, most indigenous people is the seventh uh, generation prophecy or the seven fires prophecy. So things like that, it's the reason that there's shared connection 
is because, like we mentioned before, these are geopolitical borders that the white men, that the colonizers came and brought with them. But we didn't, we had contact in all different ways before these borders were formed. So I think that that's the shared knowledge that we share. Even though we're not all identical as indigenous people, the reason there's a connection is because we would share stories and exchange. That was our form of currency. Um, when I first moved here from Hawaii, I saw um, a city called, people call it Kalama, but in my head I was like, oh, I live by a beach called Kalama back at home. So I, like, I remembered it, and then I have an auntie who told me, oh yeah, the Hawaiian, um, our Hawaiian people came here, and they exchanged and, uh, with the native people, and they stayed here because they liked it, and so they uh, named the place in honor of the connection that they had. And what I think is um, so amazing is that, so what people don't know about the Pacific is like, Okay, there's a big ocean, and on maps, they don't show you all the little islands on it. So there's like probably hundreds of islands, and on these islands are people. Well, how did the people get there? They traveled uh, through canoeing and navigation, and what I find like so amazing is that um, the Pacific Islander people traveled to probably not just North America, um, as was said earlier, we probably traveled everywhere and had our exchanges of stories, dances, and um, plants and food, and we made a connection and probably carried it on through the generations. And it's just, I just, I think it's what's cool, but also irritating is like, they talk about, oh, Christopher Columbus, all these other European um, navigators, but they don't talk about, you know, the great, triumphs that the native people have done bef what, long before that. We've been navigating across this vast expanse of ocean. We've been living in, uh, the native people have been living in North America, South America, doing fine, living great, having whole communities uh, flourishing, and that's not what is talked about. What's talked about is like the downfall so knowing how amazing our people are and have to persevere and to continue having these connections even past our ancestors, I just find it, it's, it's good to know these things. And this is a part of uh, decolonizing is relearning the stories that were taught to us from, a from our perspective. Yeah, from my experience, I would say that I still have the story from my uh, grandfather, grandma, because they are not existing right now, they're passed away. But something that I learned from them is that keep sharing this knowledge, keep sharing this music, keep sharing these plants for medicine, keep sharing uh, experiments, because they did a lot to bring us here. So. Uh, I keep asking if I can have the opportunity to uh, meet these people who already are 16 in back home. Um, and this is what happened if, uh, if you know something, you need to share it in everywhere you are. Uh, so this is amazing, learning from each other. It's very great. Um, so we're getting close to the ending um, of the panel. So does anyone from the audience have any questions? This would be a great time and I can go to you with the microphone. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for sharing and for being here today. Um, a question for you would be, what would you tell people uh, who want to be allies, who are those of us who are not indigenous, 
what would you say is, and I heard some of this at the beginning, but if you had like a really strong message for us, what would you urge us to think, to do, to consider? Um, thanks. I will say my experience. Uh, I have been teaching my nephew and niece to, teach, uh, to talk about our culture and our language. So I, I'm not afraid to speak whatever, what I go in the store. I talk to my parents and we get used to it. Uh, so this is something that I own and this is something that I carry everywhere where I go. Um, so I learned new, new different uh, part, like when I uh, was searching for internships, uh, there were questions that were asking about what part of indigenous I am. So I just, um, I don't know how can I prove this, uh, even if he, I tell them, oh, this is my blood, you can test this and uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong. Uh, this is something that I still uh, figure it out. But if he, I had the power and knowledge to say that I'm mistaken Mexican, uh, I would say write an essay in, in Mexico and tell them who teach me this language, uh, how long did I speak this language, uh, what we do, what is a custom. Uh, so all of this, I think it, it's very reasonable to, uh, to say that I'm a real indigenous. I think that the first thing to do is if someone wants to be a, an ally or a co-conspirator is to begin doing research. Um, to begin questioning and dismantling and um, analyzing one's own, not just uh, privilege, but going past that and acknowledging and recognizing the, the history, the true history um, of what your ancestors did and what other communities did, but also of the things that whosoever land you're residing on, learn, really learn whose land you're on, not just by an acknowledgement, a vocal acknowledgement, by a self-acknowledgement and through action. Um, and what I mean with action, you actually have to be asked. Get to a point where you're asked to do something by that specific community. Don't just invite yourself um, and take up space. And know how much space to take up, when to go in, when to go out. And also start reading some of the literature, but not just reading it, but also doing Finding a mentor, someone who will, because it's not their job. Indigenous peoples, our job is not to really educate all the single time, because what's gonna happen if there's only so few indigenous people? It's gonna cause a burnout. So say that you're white and there's someone who's white and is doing something racist or is culturally appropriate, be unafraid to call them out and explain why. And also, Another way is if you read Linda T. Smith's Decolonizing Research Methodologies or uh, Research Ceremony or even um, Brady Sweetgrass, those are three key foundational textbooks that are, you can start looking at, but not just read and become a philosopher or an academic, but actually take action. So say you have these most beautiful writing skills and uh, there's someone that needs you to write a grant for them. Use your writing skills in the way that that community wants and involve that community the entire way to then write that grant that they need. And be okay if they don't give you credit. Don't wait there expecting to get credit or compensation. Don't ever expect indigenous people to do your work for free either. Because think about it. How much do you put a place value or a pay for that knowledge system that they're bringing that survived more than 500 years of colonialism and cultural genocide and the boarding school system. Think about that. What price range do you give for that? <laughs> okay. You want a lesson? Okay, here it goes. Um, no, I think, um, I think one of the things uh, that, uh, that that is important is to um, to be a, to to be a good ally. I think, uh, I guess, uh, before you uh, 
you know, um, maybe before you read decolonizing methodology, but uh, maybe start with the, talking about uh, being anti-racist and doing work around anti-racism, right? Because uh, it's not enough to not be racist. You have to be anti-racist, right? And, and that, I think that will bring about a lot of like consciousness and awareness um, in how you uh, deal w with people outside of your culture, especially if you're from the dominant culture. So um, I guess I, w I would start with that. I think that um, we have to look at ways to um, bring resources into communities that are needed. A lot of the funding around uh, the grants, a lot of uh, the work that needs to happen in uh, communities of color in, in general, um, the you know the in indigenous communities, you can't necessarily pay somebody for running a sweat lodge, even though that sweat lodge is providing a service and a benefit for the community. That person cannot receive a, a, a pay. So then how, what are other ways that we could support this work, right? If there's elders that are going to be uh, going to events and providing the, and, and giving their knowledge, um, how, do we, how do we support them? How do we uh, think of creative ways that exist outside the colonial funding structures to uh, empower communities to provide solutions to their own problems. Uh, a lot of times we see, um, for example, like around the Duwamish and other areas that are, um, it's a super fun site. They have other sites that, that need to be um, changed, uh, but the government comes in and, and tries to alleviate the issue, um, but we haven't thought about um, participatory budgeting, where we allow the communities themselves to come up with solutions to their problems and empower them to to make to do that work. Um, I think if you have a skill, if you have a skill, whether it's writing grant writing, whether it's um, medicine or whatever it may be, teaching indigenous people those skills, that will help them because they're going to bring something. That, you, that the education cannot give you. That's growing up and, and being a part of, you know, uh, of this resistance. When you're born, you are born into the resistance. You don't have, a, you know, you're not, you don't choose, right? And I think that that's, uh, a lot of people, we get to a, our adolescence and, and we, we do make a choice to assimilate or to um, remain connected to our communities, right? And um, I think it was uh, Corky Gonzalez when uh, he was talking about in his poem, I Am Joaquin, he said, you know, we, we have to cho choose between assimilation and a hungry stomach, right? And so I think that these issues are things that we're facing and I think the, the, the solutions need to come from the communities that are affected themselves. And I think that the most powerful thing that people could do is get out of the way, step out of the way, step out of line, let people, you know, um, take leadership role, let them not just be in an ad advisory position, but in positions that really have control over, um, over budget. Because in this colonial system, that's where they really show value. Um, and I think that a lot of times, were left in, in, in token positions and not really given the power to make decisions over the things that will affect our everyday life. So I uh, will cut that there because I'm going to go forever. Um, so do you, do you still have an answer? Yeah. Um, so specifically talking about like Highline, which uh, that's what, where I feel like I'm like an expert. I was here like for four years before I graduated. Um, so like what I've seen like last year for the Native Student Success Summit, I knew uh, like Tanya Powers mentioned, uh, the budget was cut in half. So how can other folks on campus that have like the authority to actually do something um, be helpful in that sense where like, okay, how if they're not, 
if people are not willing to like give money for this type of summits that are bringing in and like native and indigenous students so like how like if you have higher power like how can you um, help that community manage its way into getting more money um, and then going beyond like the land acknowledgement what are you actually actively doing to help students on campus uh, succeed because uh, I know like about two years when uh, Maya Bull graduated, she was like the only Native student that was able to graduate. And I know that with me and Maya and then Geneva, uh, that she's not here right now, uh, tried to, you know, uh, make her presence known like for the Indigenous Peoples uh, Club. But it was very hard because the access was not there to students. Uh, I feel like the students are there, but it's just hard to reach them when like there's no space uh, that we can like you know be be able to reclaim as our own. It's like we had to be like in like different type of spaces, and then um, yeah, like uh, uh, Shubhdeva said. Um, just getting out of the way, and if you really want to be an ally, like help put like other indigenous folks in like those positions where they can uh, advocate for our own community um, and really don't speak for us would be another thing. Like always make sure that and like if it's uh, anything that that has to do with indigenous students or indigenous people, make sure that those people are leading in and you're just like they're like quiet. Uh, don't try to like, speak for us or take credit for work that, uh, like for like the Native Students like, Summit, like the past five years, Tanya Powers and, uh, what's her Mary? Mary Ortiz have doing so, you know, making sure that the school doesn't like like take credit for that. Sometimes I know like in higher ed institutions, when things start working out and are successful, uh, they tend to try to take credit for that and take uh, that you know hard work that went into it by like indigenous folks or other people of color, depending what it is. So just like, yeah, just. Uh, stop taking up space. I, I could mostly say let indigenous peoples lead. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna end it due to time, but I just wanna thank every single one of you for coming here, participating, and answering all the questions. Um, we had like, I wrote like 10 questions. I think that was a little ambitious uh, for the time frame we had, but thank you all so much for being here and to all of you. Uh, so this is, our final event for the day. But as we continue, you know, a lot of them share their knowledge. And I just want to tell you that there is like numerous opportunities to get involved in campus, but also outside in our communities. Uh, it just takes, literally Google is free. Like it literally takes just like Googling things that you can do. Uh, but yeah, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for everyone. And then yeah, have a wonderful day.